are all here today because you are part of the Stolot Lycée project and how lucky you are. I want to thank Mr. Combo for his dedication to this project. So in January, yes, we can. In January, you will um, you will spend a weekend. Uh, well, two days actually, a Friday and a Saturday, and you will have to come up with a startup uh, idea that you will defend in, pr in defend in front of a jury. It's already the third time that the LFSF is part of this startup lycée project, but this school year we have two innovations. The first one is that all the 10th graders are part of the project, which is kind of exciting, and the second um, innovation is that we have a prestigious partner, uh, which is the Health Business School. And the Health Business School, which is located in uh, Sansom Street, is going to host the two days in January. We are very grateful to the Health Business School, and we are very grateful to Prince Guman, Professor Prince Guman, who is here today. <laughs> He has accepted to come and uh, meet you today to talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, Mr. Uh, Prince Guman uh, created, founded his uh, first startup when he was a student, am I right? Yes, I was. Yes. College student, not as young as you guys, but almost gay. Yes. And um, so he will share with you his innovative, real world uh, work experience. And I'm sure that it's going to be very inspiring. So thank you. Thank you very much, Prince, for being there today. So you will uh, benefit from this presentation, and feel free to ask questions to, uh, to Prince. Um, thank you very much. So uh, a quick show of hands. How many 12th graders? 11? 10? Oh, man. All right. Cool. So all of you 10th graders, so everyone in this room is part of that pitch competition in a couple months, right? Yeah. In a month. I'm so jealous you guys get to do this at the same time. This is so cool. All right. Um, I thought what would be really cool is to give you guys the lecture that I planned for my Principles of Entrepreneurship class. Day one, lecture one. Before I jump into that, I think we should get to know each other a little bit. Okay. Uh, my name is Prince Guman. I am a professor of marketing, entrepreneurship, and communications at Post University. Uh, I mostly teach undergrad classes, but I will be teaching some MBA classes as well. Um, so, how did I end up here teaching in San Francisco? Well, I went to UC San Diego, and I, while going to college, I decided to start a company. I had zero background in marketing and entrepreneurship. I just decided to do it. The company was caffeinated water, water with caffeine. Kind of weird, right? Uh, they called me the crack water boy uh, on campus. Um, but it was, it was fun. It, the idea was, hey, you like coffee, it stains your teeth. Also, it's not that good once it gets goofy. If you like Red Bull, it does all kinds of funny stuff to your health. Also, it has calories and carbs, and these days, those are not cute, right? <laughs> so the idea was get you pure water with caffeine that tastes like water, and get you to cram through your finals. So, did that for a while, did well enough, and then it didn't. It was my first handsome little failure. After that, I decided to continue down the marketing route, and was the founding marketer for another startup. This one was a startup that dealt with selling auto parts on the internet. Okay? This, was a, this was a few years ago, where people actually thought you couldn't sell auto parts on the internet successfully. It was also around the time when people thought you, people wouldn't buy shoes on the internet. Sounds silly, right? I buy most of my stuff on the internet. I buy my shoes on the internet. I'm sure you guys do too. So it's quite a while ago. I'm glad because we were one of the first companies to prove uh, the established way of buying auto parts wrong. And was there for about five-ish years. Did really well. Ended up selling the company to a private equity firm. All that means is I got to make some money. Uh, once I did that, I could have uh, I had the option to either stay with the company and help build it out as a new company, as the head of marketing, or move on. And I decided to move on. I decided to quit my job and travel. I sold everything I owned into and fit my life into a backpack, 
and I just went to travel. The goal for me was to find, while I was traveling, what I call entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs who want to start something, but for one reason or another, because they don't think they know enough, or they need encouragement, whatever the reason is, they don't do it. And I, in particular, was looking for sort of off-the-cuff ideas. So, and the idea was to travel the world, meet these entrepreneurs, and write a book. Each one of these entrepreneurs' stories would be a chapter in my book, of course, if they gave, us, gave me permission to do it. Uh, so my two key success stories there were, uh, I met a entrepreneur in Italy. She always wanted to start a bakery, and you can imagine how competitive it is to sell baked goods in Italy. They're pretty damn delicious as it is. Um, but we did it. Uh, she now is opening up her third bakery. It's a chain, and my, my part in that was helping her craft an experience. And now when you walk into one of her bakeries, um, it feels like you're walking into a super old school 1930s movie theater. Everything is decked out like a movie theater. Yeah. Um, after that, I met another entrepreneur. She wanted to, and this is going to sound strange to you guys, so bear with me. She wanted to start an after school program for high school kids that was PE related, physical activity related, but it was all circus acts. So unicycle, juggling, tightrope walking, all that stuff. Super strange, right? Uh, but apparently it's not as obscure in Germany as it is out here in the States. Any, anyone from Germany here? No? Yeah? Uh, so anyways, um, helped her put together a marketing plan and figured out a way to test smaller markets. And a lot has passed since, since those years, and she now owns the biggest circus school in the state of Hawaii. So she's moved out there. Um, now, the sad story is I never got around to writing the book because sometimes when you're traveling, you also have to travel, right? You can't be working all the time. So that was that. Um, after that, who's here from, who here knows what Bitcoin is? Yeah. What do you know about Bitcoin? Uh, cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency? What else? Four hundred dollars to sixteen hundred. So that's right. I sold mine at two hundred, and it was at eighteen thousand bucks two days ago. How do I feel? You had your hand up. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. Um, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. The analogy I like to use is uh, what MP3 files and streaming did to CDs and albums, physical albums, is what Bitcoin is doing to cash. Uh, I say that because after my e pre love moment, I started to come back and actually have a job and do something with myself. And uh, I started another startup. This one was Bitcoin based. And we wanted to, um, who here is international? They have family members, oh, cool. So what we wanted to solve was sort of a problem that your parents probably face when they're sending you money back and forth, or your friends and family overseas are sending you money back and forth. Um, we decided it cost too much to do that, the Western Union and banks were charging, and it from 15 to 45 bucks per, per transaction, too much. So we built, we built a Bitcoin app that helped People send money back and forth across countries for free. We wanted to get as much user adoption as possible before we figured out a way to monetize it, sort of like the Facebook model. Um, and we did that. And it was all, all sweet, all good, until the government says, we don't like you moving money this freely between countries. We have security reasons, which I guess makes sense. Uh, the company decided to move to Canada, because Canada is a little bit more flexible with that sort of stuff right now. And I decided I like my life in San Francisco just fine. I'll keep the equity, but I decided not to do anything with it. Um, after that, <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't call that a success. I wouldn't call that a failure. I would call that to be determined. Ask me in a couple of years. The company's still around. Okay. So one success, one failure, one in between. Um, after that, I started off, well, I went to go travel again to, to get my mind right, and I was recruited by another company. This is a publicly traded company, really big in Australia, and the APAC but they had not launched their brand in the US. Um, and I was the global head of marketing for this company. I tell you that because although it was a publicly traded general in this company, not in the US. In the US, they were effectively functioning like a startup who didn't really have an established brand or a product in the US. Uh, and that is a marketer's and entrepreneur's dream because you get all the resources of a publicly traded company and you get to do all the fun stuff you typically get to do in the startup. So I did that for a while. Um, I love that job, and Holt University sought me out. Hey, friends, can you teach one class on digital marketing? Sure. I'd never taught before, never in a million years would I ever thought that I was going to teach, but I taught one class, and I fell in love with teaching. It was super cool. Um, I, there's this small little window where people look at me and talk to me, people your age, maybe a little bit older, who don't see me as the older guy, right? You don't see me as professor with a suit and a bow tie. 
What that means is I get to communicate certain ideas and I get the references we all make. Okay, we live in a Snapchat, etc., etc. type of world, and I feel like there's a small window while I can still relate to you and vice versa. So I use that every single day at work. I figure out how to do a Snapchat strategy, so it's kind of cool to get to share that knowledge that I have and also learn from my students. Uh, did that, they came back and said, we want you to work full time. So I thought about it, I slept on it for a couple of days, and I said, okay, time for a second career, and I switched to teaching. Because like I said, I love teaching. I'm, I'm surrounded in a room full of probably as many students as you guys, no more than 60, maybe 30 to 60 students in my class, and we get to talk about entrepreneurship and marketing. And I feel pretty cool that I get to do that for a living instead of sitting behind a desk for 40, 80 hours, which you might do if you're starting a startup anyways. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my long-winded background, but I, I share that with you because it is a background that is riddled with successes and failures in entrepreneurship, and it's sort of important for you guys to know why I'm here and how I got here, okay? So with that said, let's talk about startup. You've heard this before, right? Nine out of 10 new products fail. You've heard this, yes? Okay. No, no never? No. They've never heard it before. <laughs> well, guess what? Nine out of 10 startups fail. Write it down, get a tattoo when you turn 18. Nine out of 10, ta no. Um, don't get anything tattooed, bad idea. Nine out of 10 new products fail, okay? Um, if you haven't heard it, that's the math, okay? Uh, and it's not just startups that fail. It's also companies with established resources and brands who fail. And I want to talk about a couple of these failures with you guys. So we'll go through them first. Again, um, raise your hand if you find they're interesting, goofy, funny, serious, share. I do my lectures in class and they're not supposed to be me talking to you for about an hour and a half. It's supposed to be a two-way communication, two-way discussion. So if any of this stuff sounds interesting or you remember it, then please do share, share with the class, don't be shy. I'm the one who doesn't know anyone here. You guys know each other, okay? So the first failure, you guys remember this? Yeah. Yes? Who remembers it? Did you ever try it? What food was it? No? Did you try it? Who tried it? What did it taste like? Pepsi. Sugar and Pepsi? Yeah. They tried clear Pepsi. They actually tried to bring it back a couple years later just to see if the hipsters will catch on. They didn't. No offense to any hipsters in the room. You know who you are? Okay. We'll come back to see why this failed, but that's one failure. You guys remember this? Maybe you're young boy. What? The adults in the room, do you remember this? No? It's colored ketchup. Because nothing says this came out of a vegetable like purple ketchup. Yeah, Heinz, Heinz. We'll come back to why this failed, but okay. This one's old, McDLT. Okay. So, McDonald's, known for their customer service, right? Yes. So, fast food companies are logistics and operational companies. They know more about logistics and operations than most corporations. The reason why is their entire business model really emphasizes the fast part of food. So they internally have this massive metric where they've measured time it takes from the moment payment is complete the moment the customer receives their food, okay? And currently, the, the fastest fast food is Burger King, and McDonald's currently is the slowest, believe it or not. Um, this was about a decade and a half ago, and in their attempt to even be faster, they came up with McDLT. Uh, it was a box with buns, your meat, and some veggies. You put it together. <laughs> I'm sure this will be really easy for you guys to guess why I failed, but... <laughs> Who remembers this? Who owns one of these? Just, I won't judge you much. <laughs> Raise your hand higher. Anyone here? No? Uh, the best thing that came out of Google Glasses was the nickname of people who walk around with glasses in the Bay Area. People call them glass holes because that's the impression they get off. <laughs> also failed. We'll dissect why this thing failed. Okay. Yes, Apple tried a gaming console. Yes, it failed. Apple tried what you might call a tablet. You might know about this. The Newton. <laughs> Also failed. We'll come back. 
There's always one person in class that goes, no, Professor Gooman, no, no, no. I see these around still. Yeah, that lucrative mall cop market is pretty big. <laughs> but I'll tell you why. You have one? I can't, do you actually have one? No? Do you know how the founder of Segway died? Yeah, he used it. One more example. So let's go back. Well, let's, let's start over. I want to show you. Let's talk about why. Why do you think Crystal Pepsi failed? Nothing to. There's already Pepsi. Yeah. What's the obvious differentiator here? How do you guys feel about drinking soda that drinking Pepsi that's clear? Not that bad. Yeah. Kind of weird? Kind of bad? Well, Pepsi found out the hard way, no matter what you ask people in the lab and focus groups and surveys, when you actually shoot the product out in the wild, the reaction was negative. People felt it was an obscure thing. What are you doing? <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, clear Pepsi freaked people out. They used to drinking black cola for generations, you know, and clear Pepsi was too strange. Uh, I'll be honest with you, when I was selling the, uh, the caffeine water, a lot of students on campus either loved it or got freaked out by it. There was no lukewarm reception. People were like, oh, this is cool. I've never heard of this before. This is great. This is going to help me out. And people were like, this is weird. I don't, I'm afraid of this. No, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Similar thing. Okay, um, so how often do you see blue in nature in terms of food? How often do you see blue food with the exception of blueberries because they're kind of like dark. dark. Not often, not often, right? Imagine that multiplied with all these other colors. Uh, yes? Also you can use the yellow one with mustard. You do confuse the yellow one with mustard. This is really good for a prank, not good for a product. So Heinz found out the hard way that consumers, again, similar to Pepsi, weren't feeling comfortable putting different colored ketchup on. Okay. We touched on this already. Okay, you're not known for your customer service as it is, but I'm paying you 100% of my money, I want you to make 100% of my burger. That seemed to be the uh, response from customers. Don't remind me that this is such a fast food restaurant that you can't even do this. <laughs> Blue glasses. What do you guys think? Embarrassing. They're embarrassing? Yeah. What else? Expensive. Expensive. How much were they? What's that? Uh, <laughs> Two grand. Two thousand dollars. Yeah, the tech wasn't quite there. Yeah. So they're not practical. What was that? They're not practical. They're not practical. I mean, I'm going to combine your response because you said technology was there. Yes, clearly, because that looks awkward, right? You don't want glasses that have a whole part of the thing blacked out. Another company attempted this recently. Oh, sorry. Uh, can we see actually who did or not? Can we see what? The word. Uh, not can you just see yeah. around you? You could, but this side powered the entire screen, so it's like playing a bit, you know a video character puts on a helmet and all of a sudden oh, yeah. Yeah. there's artificial intelligence or uh, artificial reality based on it, sort of like that. Oh, and you just speak to it like, okay, Google, take a picture and take a picture. The entire time you're losing all your friends because you keep talking to you this okay, Google way. Um, another company tried this and it was actually more fashionable. How many of you own spectacles? I have to watch myself around YouTube. How many of you use Snapchat? I'd say that's a pretty poor adoption rate, right? Two out of a room of 60. So, the gaming console, it's a lot to dissect. But this is at a time where Atari, Nintendo, and Sega were fighting over the market share, and they had their own in-house games that people had, they, they made their own in-house games. Apple did not want to make their own games. 
They want other companies to make games for them. Which works today. Those gamers in the room know it works today, but it didn't at the time. Now, you can make a very good case. You can say, Professor Prince, Newton was not a failure. iPad and iPhone. Whatever lessons they learned from that handsome failure turned into an iPad, an iPhone, a smartphone, the way we know it today. And arguably the Android. Right, but smartphone. So, who here thinks this is not a failure because you see these all the time? Good. Tourist, tourist groups is where I see them often, of course, mall cops. Uh, here's the thing Segway, when they first launched, this is the CEO's quote. He wanted Segway to do what cars did for horse drawn carriages. <laughs> Right. He wanted to change the way we go from point A to point B. Did it do that? That's, that's my case of why it's technical failure. The other issue with them, Segway, the cost was 14 to 16 grand when it first came So I can buy myself a Honda Civic or Segway. Right? And you don't need to wear a bicycle. Don't need to wear a bicycle. No, no. <laughs> and also, if you want mass adoption for a product that early on, if you want to do what cars did to horse-drawn carriages, most people can't afford 16 grand, right? Especially for something like this. Henry Ford did it, but Henry Ford did it because he made cars freakishly cheap for that time. And that's how he got that mass adoption. He wanted to be Henry Ford 2.0. I definitely admire, we all kind of have to admire these lofty goals, but it didn't work out. What's also sort of disappointing is how many here? How many of you guys have like a boosted skateboard or any of the hoverboards? A couple. One, two. Okay. Isn't that in effect just this shrunken down? Yeah. And yet Segway doesn't make that. They've had 15 years of heads up of making this technology and miniaturizing it. If they truly wanted to, they didn't pivot, even when new products came out. There's no reason why they can't create an electric skateboard to compete with all the electric skateboards that are coming out. Happen. Still happen. This one we won't spend too much time on because I think it's quite obvious. What is Donald Trump's brand? Pre presidency. Buildings. Buildings, hotels, luxury ish, right? <laughs> and then he thought that he could carry his brand equity over to sell food. Kind of strange. Steaks, more so strange. On TV, this was only sold on QVC, the TV shopping network. Oh my god. <laughs> <It's> so <crazy. laughs> So yeah, it's, it's sort of fun to do a, a, a post-mortem of these failed products. And we can go through startups as well, but I want to pick bigger products that you can find more stuff on online. So, so far I've been focusing on this question. Why do 90% of startups fail? I think we're asking the wrong question. I think we need to zoom in on why the rest of the 10% succeed. And what I'm about to show you has been dissected many different times before. If you're super curious about this, there's a book called Eating the Big Fish. Um, ask me about it after class. Uh, but, story time. What are we looking at? David and Goliath. Who knows the suck story can summarize it in like 20 seconds? Yes, David versus Goliath. What happened? So, there was a giant and a small guy. <laughs> and uh, no one could kill the giant, even armies and stuff. And the small guy took a rock and put it in his eye, and you know, the giant died. Okay, that's that's a perfect summary. We have Christine. We have until two o'clock, right? Uh, until three. Actually. Until three. Yeah, you have two. You have two hours. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so here's the story. You summarize it very well. Thank you so much. Um, oh, clicker's not working. Hang on. So yes, there was a, it's a classic story of the Philistines versus the Israelites. Deadlocked. What does that mean? So war back in the day was not the way war is today. Okay. Back in the day, let's say I decide to go to war with you, sir. And we would basically say, all right, let's get our soldiers to put on their finely high-end uniforms and their best garments and meet in this park. We'll meet in this park. We'll draw a line in this park. When we're ready to go to war, we'll cross that line and let's kill each other to see who wins. Sometimes they even had bands to go to them. 
I play music on the way there. Um, I, I am simplifying, but not by much. Okay? That's how war was. Uh, that's exactly what they did. They found a valley to meet, and unfortunately, no one wanted to cross the line. So that was deadlock. They were there for weeks and weeks, going through all of their food, and basically camping, waiting for someone to declare war. Over time, they decided, look, let's not do this. Uh, let's do single combat. We, all, we should all know single combat, right? You pick your biggest person, your best warrior, I pick my best warrior, we'll let them fight it out, we'll watch, whoever wins, wins the war, we'll save thousands of lives, winners take the land, you guys go away. Something like that, okay? That's single combat. So, this is who they sent. Can you watch that? This is, this is who they sent. Based on, based on uh, written accounts, he, they can estimate that Goliath, that's not actually Goliath, that's Game of Thrones. I know you guys watch it. Um, he was about six foot nine, okay? Any basketball fans in here? LeBron James, roughly the height of LeBron James. Really tall. Six foot nine in those days, especially really tall. Okay. Human races over time gotten taller across the board. That was frequently tall for those times. He came out, he was fully armored, head to toe. Okay. Uh, he had a massive broadsword, a javelin, a long distance, uh, a javelin and a spear, shield, just decked out. Okay. He was, if he was a video game character, he maxed out fully on all the weapons and all, and all the armor. And at first, no one came out, obviously. That's scary. I wouldn't come out in front of him either. But then eventually someone did. <laughs> <laughs> someone did. Uh, of course, none of the Israelites wanted to come forward, and then David did. And they said, all right, David, you're courageous. Um, here's, here's a sword. He goes, no, I don't need the sword. No, thank you. Okay, here's a shield. Nah, I'm okay. I don't need the shield. Well, what are you going to do? Well, I've got my walking stick. I have these rocks in my pocket. <coughs> and what? You know, uh, some accounts said he was a little crazy. And you would see why, right? So, this is a story that you summarized. Puts a stone in his slingshot, licks it at him, hits him in the eye. He goes down, runs over, grabs his own sword, and kills him. <laughs> Now, I'm going to ask a question that's going to look pretty obvious, but I'm curious if we can dissect this. Why? Why is this an upset? Why is this shocking? Yeah? Because it's usually the big, the big guy that always wins. Yeah. yeah. Very well put. Size. It's very rare that you see a big guy lose to a smaller person, right? What else? Yes, ma'am. It's true. That's right. Remember, he basically came out in street clothes. Athleisure from back in the day. He came out in street clothes and fought someone with full on armor and beat him. One more thing. What else? Think about what David does for a living. What is he? What does a shepherd do? Take care of cattle, sheep, exactly. What did Goliath do? Kill. Kill? I mean, we can, yeah, professional killing machine. He's a soldier, right? So those are three things. Number one, size. Tiny child versus grown man. Overgrown man, six foot nine. Kind of freaky, especially for those times. Experience, shepherd versus warrior. And resources, this is what you said back there, was one of them was fully decked out and all of the things you can buy for war. So, that's why it's an upset. Now let's take a closer look. Have you seen this before? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Have you seen this before? Yeah. Okay. When I said slingshot, what came to mind? This or this? First one, right? Exactly. Well, it turns out slingshots back in those days didn't look like the slingshots that we imagined. They were like that. Then you actually put rocks or, or, or balls in there, spun them, and threw them. And people have been able to recreate this, and here's the data that we created. It goes as fast as 35 meters per second. If you can't imagine that, imagine a baseball. That's faster than throwing a baseball. Okay. Uh, people were able to spin it seven revolutions per second. It's pretty fast. 
That was seven. That was more than a second. And the rocks in that valley, remember the park? Remember the park where they meant to go to war? The rocks in that valley were made of barium sulfate. Now, this is not a chemistry class. It doesn't matter if you know what barium sulfate is. Just know that barium sulfate makes rocks extra hard. Okay? By some estimates, 50% higher in density than normal rocks found in that area. Okay? So, um, people have been able to throw these things at a distance of 200 yards. Pretty far. That's two football fields. It's two football fields. I was going to make a soccer reference, but I don't know how long a soccer field is. Does anyone? Any soccer fans here? 90 yards? Cool. So more than two football fields. And people were able to even hit birds in flight. <laughs> All of a sudden, I want the line. That's how they, they calculated ballistics and the strength of this thing, and it was equivalent to a nine. Pretty freaky, huh? So what we thought was just a tiny little rubber band and 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 a wishbone was actually essentially capable of doing this, and he got shot in the head. So the other little piece is uh, what I'm calling rock paper scissors. The way war was, I simplified it a bit, but it was essentially a giant bloody game of rock, paper, scissors. Those days, right? There's the infantry, which are the super heavy soldiers, with all of the gear. There's cavalry, typically on horses. Their big thing is speed. Okay? And then there is artillery, long distance. These are the snipers in Call of Duty. These are the bows and arrows. Okay? And they all have a uh, rock, paper, scissor type relationship. So if you were to guess, which one of these three would you say was black? Infantry. Infantry, okay. Correct. Which one would you say is David? Artillery. Cool. You're right. And artillery beats infantry in terms of strategy because they're long distance. And infantry can only be effective when they're up close. So, so, certain assumptions were made. And this is important because this is all going to tie into entrepreneurship. Assumptions. Um, the Philistines expected the way war has been traditionally. Infantry versus infantry. Infantry. Send me your LeBron James, I'll send you my LeBron James. Let's have them fight it out. Whoever wins, wins the war. They expected hand to hand. They expected smaller quarters, small little circle to fight in, which is all great because this is what Goliath is great at. And it's not what happened. Right? Those assumptions were challenged in an unexpected fashion by David, who did not choose close quarters. He chose long distance, which was what which was the only thing he knew. Okay? And think about it. If he can hit a bird with a stone, he can hit a six foot nine giant. Right? The analogy here, I'm going to run with my basketball analogies here. It's like a three point contest between Shaq and Steph Curry. Steph Curry's going to win every time. So, what was also cool, this came out later on, was people took a closer look at Goliath. And certain accounts say that he was led to the battlefield by a servant, which is kind of weird. He's a warrior. Walk yourself to the battlefield. Why do you need someone to hold your hand, literally? He was slow. He moved slow. Um, and when he saw David come down, essentially wearing t-shirt and jeans, just kidding, not t-shirt and jeans, but not wearing any war regalia, he sort of didn't really have a reaction to it. Okay? So, turns out, the Indiana Medical Journal um, discovered acromegaly. What is it? You guys know what H-E-H is? It's the stuff that we get when we're kids, naturally. It's what makes us grow. And then over time, your body starts making a lot less of it, but you stop growing, okay? Um, and it comes out of the pituitary gland in your forehead. Uh, acromegaly is a form of a disease where you have an overactive HGH, which means you, your body keeps producing it and you die an early death. Does, does that sound like anyone you know who kept growing and then died early? Oh. How about you guys think of one person? What was it? With, giant, with the giant from Game of Thrones? Yeah, most definitely the giant from Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, side effects are poor vision, nearsightedness, double vision, and slower responses. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Kind of like Goliath, right? So obviously you can't prove it. But if you match the symptoms of giantism, this one in particular, <laughs> and what's been reported about him. Remember Andre the Giant? No? Mm -hmm. You know Obey the brand? Yeah. Yeah. You know the face on the brand? 
you know, that's his face. You didn't know that. That's the whole reason why Obey got so big is he put Andre the Giant's face on it and it got viral because people who remembered him when they were kids loved the brand because it had Andre the Giant's face on it. Went from tagging to a brand that grew. Pretty interesting story. I, I would have never guessed that that would have been something that worked, but it did. But anyways, he had the Giantism. And yes, so it is, I forget his name. Bonus points if you know what his name is. Huh? He died recently. I know. But well, he came Don't back spoil. as an ice, ice man, right? <laughs> no, but not the teacher, the actor. Oh, the actor died. Oh. OK. We've heard this before. Yes. Beauty is not a beholder. I'm just going to use this, change it a little bit. Strength is not a beholder. This is where all the stuff that we're talking about, assumptions, resources, size, all the things that typically are indicative of certain victory aren't. So let's go back. So he's fast, that also makes him slow. And if he actually had giantism, which seems like he did, makes him slow physically and mentally. Okay? He's fast, that means he can't see as quickly, he can't move as quickly. Um, and armor, yes, you have all the money in the world for armor, but it does slow you down. Okay? So this is me flipping what we thought were really good things about the life into it could be negatives in front of certain people. Now, is that a strength or a weakness? Um, it's a strength, but it's a strength for bummer. It's okay. Uh, David's weaknesses, and they have quotes on it. Okay, David's weaknesses. He's small. He's not wearing armor. That actually makes him faster. The word I have on the slide that if it would show up, Siri, show my slide. Damn. HBO now. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yay! All right. There we go. Boom. David's weaknesses. He's actually pretty fast. Not having armor helped him use his slingshot and use it fairly accurately, okay? Uh, he was lean and agile. I'll put these words on purpose because the, the startup way of doing business is typically called the lean methodology or the agile methodology. Why? Because when you're a startup, you have to be nimble. You don't have an established business model, okay? You're not HP who's been around for so many decades, they have all this customer data and you can continue building on all this data. Um, and you have to be lean, meaning you can't do big company trips. You have only so much money, sometimes zero money, okay? You have to force yourself to not have this beautiful product that has all the features in the world. You have to put a gun to your head and pick one or two features that you want to launch with. It's a prototype, it's an MVP, okay? Those are the types of decisions a startup has to make because they have to, not because, well, HP can't because they have the money to do all the above, so they do, okay? Some can argue that's what Apple is doing right now. Who here has an iPhone? Who here has an Android? <laughs> it's pretty, it, it's, it, you can make a pretty good argument that Apple has lost all drive to innovate. OS and hardware wise. I have an iPhone, so I, I'm not, I'm not an Android guy pushing it on. But because you look at the history and look at how hard they innovated initially to get massive share of the market, and they're not really trying that hard anymore. Whereas Samsung and Google are trying really hard right now because they have to, they have to compete with Apple, who owns the hardware market when it comes to smartphones. So, that said, uh, before I jump into exactly how, how do you think this applies to companies and the business world? So many hands. I'll start there mostly because I can't see them, I just see a hand. Even though it might be smaller, um, techies is more important than big in quantity. Okay, I'll take that. Absolutely, yeah. I saw a hand up here. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, sometimes uh, big uh, companies. Uh, can have less success than uh, small friends that just uh, came up. Yeah. Can we think of any examples? Can we think of a real life David versus Goliath where Goliath lost? Yeah. 
Yes, um, in the Exodus uh, last week or something uh, like that, uh, we learned that um, for the planes, there were uh, two uh, sites uh, for creating the, the planes. Mm -hmm. And um, there was two uh, brothers who were uh, really poor and uh, they were just, they just wanted to fly. And like uh, the, the big scientists and stuff and actually uh, the two brothers uh, get to invent the real plane and um, the big, uh, yeah. the big. Well, you're right. Uh, I also read that somewhere too. The Wright brothers, right? The story of the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, they were in, I think, Wisconsin or somewhere where it was not considered the, the hotbed for inventions at the time. And a lot of people with a lot more money were pushing forward with trying to figure out a way to fly because someone had put a, I think it was a hundred thousand dollar bounty on anyone who can fly a vehicle gets a hundred thousand um, dollars. And there was one team based out of New York City that had reporters all over them, super glorified, all the money in the world that they fundraised, and then there were the Wright brothers just messing around in their backyard, and it worked out for them. Yeah, that's that's a great story. What else? Think of brands. Think of your favorite brands in your head. Were they ever an underdog? Maybe, maybe not. Um, yeah. Is it forced to have a Goliath? Can it only be a David that has nothing, that is not wealthy, but has no concurrent? No, another Goliath can take out another Goliath as well. Is that what you're asking? No. Oh, what are you asking? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, Oh, he wants to talk about a brand that, like, there is no kind of no presence that he is around in his film. Yeah, what brand are you thinking of? Are you asking me or are you thinking of one? Okay. Uh, I think I know what you're asking, and if I don't, try again, because I'll, I'll, I speak five languages and French isn't one of them. Uh, a, a good example I think of right now is Under Armour. You guys know the brand? Yeah. Yeah. They haven't killed Reebok, they haven't killed Nike, they haven't killed Adidas, but guess what? They're one of the leading brands. They went public, right? They're publicly traded, really good sports brand. They weren't earlier. When I was your guys' age, they just made undershirts for football players. That's all they made. Under Armour. So they haven't exactly slayed Goliath, but in many ways they were agile and young and fought into a very competitive market. And, and the story behind Under Armour, one of the stories behind Under Armour is this. So let me put it in perspective for you. So this sports clothing brand market is very intense. Okay? Um, LeBron James has a lifetime contract with Nike that's going to net him a billion dollars by the time he turns 60. Capital B, billion. Okay. Uh, if you guys follow basketball, James Harden just signed a 200 plus odd million dollar contract with Adidas. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Neymar, soccer fans. Also hundreds of millions of dollars. The point is, it's really hard to compete because people buy what their favorite athletes wear because it's a sports brand. That's obvious, right? I like football, I like basketball, Kobe is my favorite basketball player. Oh, Nike, I guess I should buy Nike because Kobe wears Nike. You can, I can get that. So how is someone like Under Armour to compete? Well, they know they couldn't. They were a small company, they technically are still fairly small compared to Nike. Um, the way they competed was they didn't want to play the game, at least before they got Steph Curry. They did not want to play the game of getting superstars because they couldn't afford to. So who are the sponsor? A mixed race ballerina. A mixed race ballerina because no one expected them to. Misty, yes, Misty Copeland. Do you know the story? Uh, yeah. What do you know about Misty Copeland? Do you mind sharing? Shh. Hey, back there. Well, Shh. She's one of the first major black ballerinas in the U.S. Yep. And um, she grew up in a poor family. She only started ballerina when she was 13. And, well, she went through a lot. She went through a lot, and basically she added yeah. ABT. 
yep, yep. She did get into it. She got rejected quite a few times. When Under Armour heard about the story, they decided to take her on as a, as a sponsor. And the thing about this that's really cool is she got rejected, and the first commercial for it was her reading out her own rejection letter. And it says some really mean things. Okay? The rejection letter says, I'm sorry, but you have too many curves to be a ballet dancer. You don't have the body fit to be a ballet dancer. And this is like a 13 or 14, and she was a teenager. Um, maybe your skills are better off being a dancer in Vegas. This is what her rejection letter says. That's harsh, huh? And the Under Armour commercial starts off with her reading this while she's obviously in the background. And I don't know Bella very well, but what she does, I could never do it in a million years. And that sort of encapsulates the brand story that was the young startup Under Armour, right? So those types of things got people like Steph Curry, who obviously you know now is, is a killer, uh, to sign with them, right? That, that sort of stuff resonates with people. Um, what, other, what else? Nice little tangent, I appreciate that. Um, what other brand actually took out another brand? Yeah? Lamborghini and Ferrari. Are they Goliaths or Davids? Lamborghini uh, is David. You think so? No. Well, uh, uh, initially? Lamborghini started as an attractive company, and mm -hmm. he also knows from Ferrari, she started his own company, and Ferrari uh, uh, got rid of him, and um, so uh, Lamborghini got his own like, years, like scissor bolts and stuff, and he now uh, kind of moved to Monte as well. Cool. All right. Yes. Netflix took out Blockbuster. Yeah, I love that example. We use it a lot more in, in, in class. You guys remember Blockbuster? Of course you do. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm not giving you guys Why the credit. No. Sounds like all of you have to pay surcharges for not rewinding your VCR tape, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Blockbuster. Rent a movie for five bucks. Who wants to do that? Here's what was fascinating about Blockbuster. Shh, here's what was fascinating about Blockbuster. It's really hot in here, huh? Here's what's fascinating about Blockbuster. Uh, they were a publicly traded company, had all the resources in the world. People said, hey, people are, someone is starting a company and they're just mailing disks. They said, there's no way people are gonna mail this. They're gonna get destroyed. There's no way. Nope, Netflix kept pushing through. Netflix doesn't even sell disks anymore, right? It's full on streaming platform now. Quick no. They send you disks. They send you disks. What else? That's a really good example. There's a particular tech company that I'm thinking of. <coughs> we all use this. Yes. It's not the tech. It's not probably not what it's thinking about, but it's in a way John Rockefeller is David. David. Who's a Goliath? Yeah, there is. <laughs> 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 you guys talk about Rockefeller in one of your classes? No. No? <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's an interesting one. It's, uh, yes and no. Ma uh, Apple was pretty close to no longer being a successful company. They made printers, they made wires. It's kind of weird to think about Apple making printers, right? This is after they fired Bill jo uh, Steve jo Bill Jobs. Bill Jobs. <laughs> Uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. It's after the, after they fired Steve Jobs, <laughs> and they started to make everything. It was what Apple made was you couldn't tell apart what Apple made versus what HP made. And when they acquired everyone's favorite movie making company called Pixar, Apple, he came on and he was the CEO again. The number one thing he did, he said, "We're not agile or lean enough." is he killed all products but the original iMac. He so said, that's all we're going to make. All resources, all design, all hardware, all software must now only work for one product. And he killed all the printers and all the wires and all the random stuff to be sold. Um, so in that sense, absolutely. Because they went from almost having uh, two, three percent market share, and now it doesn't sound like a lot, but Mac has like an 18 percent market share. In a really big PC company. Um, and what, what Apple did, they had the nerve to do, which most companies don't, is they introduced the iPod, right? Yeah. And they owned that market full on. They, Motorola Zoom, who even knows what that is? Oh, uh, sorry, Microsoft Zoom, no one, right? And then they knew that the moment they introduced the iPhone, it's going to 
effectively kill the iPod. So imagine sitting down in a boardroom and saying, well, we're making billions and billions of dollars off of our iPod, but I have an idea that's gonna kill that. It takes a particular type of leadership to say, okay, let's do it. That's walk away from guaranteed hundreds of billions of dollars in iPod sales. That's getting people to buy our computers, which we've been trying to fight against Microsoft for decades. Because people buy an iPod, and they sort of think about buying a Mac. Right? People buy an iPhone, might, if they don't already own a Mac, they might consider it. And Steve Jobs made the decision that, yeah, we're going to go ahead and disrupt our own selves. We're going to go ahead and kill our own product and launch iPhone. Still haven't gotten one tech company yet. We're in San Francisco. Yes, sir. Amazon to many retail stores, but the perfect example you're probably thinking of is Barnes and Noble, the bookstore. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon killed the bookstore, sadly. Yes, sir. Yes. Uber tax. Taxis are still around, but how, how many of us take taxis now? <laughs> it's only when the surcharge is really high, right? And that's when they don't try to surcharge anymore. Yeah, Uber and taxis, absolutely. Here's what I have for you guys. Uber versus yellow cabs, absolutely. Airbnb versus Hilton, I'll pick the particular brand for Airbnb. It did took a massive chunk out of the hospitality business. <laughs> Yellow Pages, you guys know what that is? Yeah. It's a really big book. You want to guess what color the pages are? It had all the business listings and listings of people and your names. So we worry about privacy these days, but back in those days, a book showed up that had all your neighbors' names and phone numbers on it. Um, but now we have something much better. Cash registers and Square. Square was the first company that really changed how small a cash register could be. Right? I think what Square did is phenomenal. Now they have so many other companies that copy what Square does. SpaceX versus NASA. Do you guys know this story? Okay. SpaceX. I'll tell you the story when you guys quiet down. Just a little bit. Not too much. Just a little bit. So, we all know NASA. Yes. Yes. Okay, SpaceX, CEO is Elon Musk, okay? The modern day uh, Iron Man. So here's the thing. He said, why aren't we making better rockets? They, the ambiguous they said, Elon, you're doing great. You made PayPal, you made Tesla. You're not a rocket scientist. Why are we talking about rockets? There's not a market for it. He said, why aren't we making better rockets? He went and talked to NASA. He went and talked to his, anyone who would talk to him to say, can I buy one of your rockets? Because I think I could make a better rocket. I said, no. Mm -hmm. What he found out that they were still using the same rockets from the 70s. When I say same rockets, I don't mean the same design. Literally the same rockets made and stored in the 70s. They pull, pull one out and shoot it out into outer space. There aren't that many things that are so technological that have stayed the same since the 70s, right? Fair, 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 fair statement to make? So you actually had to buy from Russia the rocket and study it with his team and said, you know what, we can do better. This is too expensive, it doesn't make sense, but you can shoot this up, you spend all this money to shoot, and it doesn't land itself, and you can't reuse it. So people kept saying he was crazy, this is not gonna happen, you don't have the funding. NASA has more money than you, this sound familiar? David versus Goliath all over again. And of course, if you're following SpaceX at all, um, he's had, I think, four successful launches and landing, and he's already selling to anyone who's looking to buy. So, I love that story for the simple fact that it, it, it totally, it totally calls him out for being crazy, and then at the end of the day, he was able to deliver, even with his madness. Okay, um, and then we do a different lecture on the mindset of an entrepreneur and how it is. You see it over and over. There's a little bit of madness in someone who doesn't have all the data in the world to execute on something and says to go with it anyways. Mm -hmm. If she succeeds, it's a great success story. If she fails, then people get to point fingers and laugh, right? We did it for Pepsi, we did it for Heinz Purple Ketchup, we're pointing a finger and laughing because it was a pretty miraculous failure, right? But if it worked out, it worked out. And of course, Tesla versus all cars. What do I mean by that? There has not been an American car company who went public in a very long time. When I said public, I mean went to the stock market because it's really hard to compete in the car market. Tesla came in and did exactly that. Within 10 years of launching a company, Tesla was publicly traded, and now we all know 
anyone who's a car guy probably wants to drive a car, test it. My car guy or gal. So yeah. <clears throat> then I want to open everything up. <laughs> Any questions? We can talk about what we just talked about. Uh, if you guys want pointers to help pitch, I know you guys have been working with staff, but I just hosted a pitch competition last Friday. Um, I just want to talk about my pitching and my success and failures. Um, I'm happy to do that too, but I want to kind of make this your time to use me as a resource. If you have questions about Halt, or what you're getting into, what products are you guys working on? Do you guys have products already? No. no. Too early for products, huh? Yeah. Have you guys started thinking about what problem you want to solve? No. Yes, no. I'm just sorry, no. Okay. Have you guys gone to a pitch competition before? Yes. No. Max. I know. Man, maybe go to one between now and then just to get an idea of how people do it. I'll, I'll tell you guys a story about my pitch competition. The last one I went to. This was at eBay PayPal back when there was still one company. And it was a 24 hour come network, build a product, and pitch in front of people. And I decided to make a product for fun. Um, that's just, who here is good at public speaking? Thank you for not being modest, yeah, okay. Who here is okay at public speaking? Okay. Who here, is, who here thinks they're funny? <laughs> <laughs> who here, if I could grant you one wish and it was you could be funnier, would want that wish? No, one wish? Wish for like infinite funnier. wishes. Funnier. Huh? That's the only wish you get. You get one wish. Yeah, wish for infinite wishes. Which is, I will make you funnier. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the thing. We made, so what I made was sort of the Airbnb of stand-up comedy. Anytime you have a public speaking engagement, especially speeches and wedding speeches, and now this is kind of young for you guys, uh, there's this pressure to be good at public speaking, and there's a pressure to be funny. What we did overnight, we recorded a platform that looked like a poor person's Airbnb where you can log in and you can talk about what sort of event you have. Hi, my name is Prince Gooman. I'm the best man at a wedding. Answer a bunch of questions. I need a speech. And then we take that information and we send it off to stand-up comedians who write a funny speech for you within 24 hours. You can be funny for 99 bucks at a time. For five minutes only, though. Uh, so, that, so Again, that's not a, we're not talking about oh, game changing stuff here, but it was just fun. It was just fun to drink a bunch of Red Bulls for 24 hours and make sure you code this thing out. And I'm not a coder. I was a person pitching and coming up with the idea and all that stuff. So everyone played a different role. Um, and it was, it was a ton of fun. And I, if this is your first time doing it at this stage, that's great. It's a fun experience, even if you don't want to be an entrepreneur one day. Um, but definitely, you're in San Francisco. You have to go see some of these guys pitch. They've been practicing for so long, and they're, they're amazing at it. How long is your pitch? Eight How many minutes? Yeah. One minute. No, no, it's not. Five Just making stuff up. Five, five, five minutes? Okay. That's a long time. Uh, typical pitches are two to three minutes. So you guys, is there a question and answer afterwards? I think they ask questions. Do they ask questions? Ooh. Can I judge this? Okay. No more questions? Okay. Ben, thank you guys for your time. Appreciate your